Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Good morning. My name is Willow Langell, and I'm a, can everybody hear me? Not very well. I don't know if this can get really closer, but my name is Willow Langell, and I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Chicago in Religious Ethics, and it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Hare. Um, Professor Hare is Noah Porter Professor of Philosophical Theology at Yale Divinity School. He received his doctorate from Princeton University. His interests extend to ancient philosophy, medieval Franciscan philosophy, Kant, Kierkegaard, contemporary ethical theory, the theory of atonement, medical ethics, international relations, and aesthetics. He is the author of God and Morality, a Philosophical History, which gives a framework for a history of ethics, emphasizing the theological premises present in the original versions of the main types of ethical theory. He is also the author of The Moral Gap, which develops an account for the need for God's assistance in meeting the moral demand, God's Call, which discusses the divine command theory of morality, and Why Bother Being Good, which in which he treats the question, can and why should we be morally good? He has also written a commentary on Plato's Euthyphro and is the co-author of Ethics and International Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hare. In this uh, paper, I'm going to describe three arguments for the dependence of morality upon religion. All three come from Kant, the first two directly and the third indirectly. The first argument is that morality becomes rationally unstable if we do not have a way to assure ourselves that morality and happiness are consistent and that believing in God provides such assurance. The term unstable here is Immanuel Kant's. He's not arguing that a life committed to meeting the moral demand is impossible without belief in God, but that there is a certain kind of rational instability in such a combination. We know many more people than Kant did who combine a morally good life with unbelief in God. And indeed, the lives of some of them put the lives of many believers in God to shame. Nonetheless, I will try to argue that this combination betrays a lack of rational fit. Sometimes people who know Kant's moral theory but do not know his moral theology wonder why he would bring in happiness at all Is he not committed to the view that morality is to be pursued for its own sake and that requiring a connection with happiness would be a pollution of this kind of purity? To reply to this worry, it's helpful to see how he distinguishes his view from the views he attributes to the Stoics and the Epicureans. The Stoics, he says, held that happiness is simply being virtuous and knowing that you're virtuous. The Epicureans held that virtue is simply the dispositions that lead to happiness, whatever they are. Kant objects to both of these views. We humans are not merely rational, but also creatures of sense and creatures of need. If we were merely rational, perhaps our highest good would be purely a life of virtue. But because we are this combination, our highest good is a union of virtue and happiness, which are two different things. Virtue is the disposition to live by duty or the moral law, and happiness is the satisfaction of our inclinations as a sum, or where everything goes the way we we would like it to. From this definition, we can see that complete happiness is not available on Earth for beings with our limited capacities, since we always tend to misidentify 
what will in fact give us this satisfaction. Since these are different, the Stoics are wrong to try to reduce happiness to virtue, but the Epicureans, in reducing virtue to the means to happiness, are also wrong because they fail to give us morality at all. Morality requires that we seek to do our duty for its own sake, and not for the sake of happiness. Since we're both rational beings and creatures of sense and of need, our highest good requires a union of virtue and happiness. This union is not merely for us as individuals, but our morality gives us the end or goal of the happiness of all, proportional to the virtue of all. This end is the combination of our own happiness and the happiness of others, and our own virtue and the virtue of others. But since our morality gives us this end, the highest good, we must, if we are to pursue the morally good life in a way that is rationally stable, believe that this highest good is really and not merely logically possible. Real possibility has to be founded on what is actual. But we do not see that we have the capacity to bring this highest good about. What we see, on the contrary, is a world in which people who are not committed to the moral law get large amounts of what they wish and will. And those who are committed to it often end in misery and frustration. Nature, Kant says in one of his most purple passages, is indifferent to our moral purposes, as far as we can tell from our sense experience. In order to sustain our belief in the real possibility of the highest good, we therefore have to postulate the existence of a supersensible author of nature who can bring about the conjunction of happiness and virtue. And thus, I quote, morality inevitably leads to religion. Kant says throughout the corpus that we have to recognize our duties as God's commands. His reason relates primarily to this first argument I've just given. We have to recognize our duties as God's commands because it's only if they're God's commands that we can rationally believe in the real possibility of the highest good, which is the end that morality itself gives to us. When Kant defines religion as recognizing our duties as God's commands, the notion of religion is of a moral faith that how things ought to be is sustained by how things fundamentally are, that is, by the governance of the universe. Kant thus subscribes to the scholastic picture of three roles of God as sovereign, distinguishing God's legislative, executive, and judicial authority. On this picture, God makes the law and promulgates it by command, runs the universe in accordance with this law, and then judges our success in keeping this law. Not only Kant, but also the utilitarian tradition in moral theory has, in its classical authors, endorsed a version of this argument from providence. Now, this first argument I'm going to give you, or just have, is what I'm calling the argument from providence. J.S. Mill, in his Essays on Religion, says that we need hope with respect to the government of the universe if we are to sustain the moral life. Otherwise, we're kept down by what he calls the disastrous feeling of not worthwhile. Henry Sidgwick, in Methods of Ethics, recognized that the only way to reconcile enlightened self-interest with aiming at the maximum balance of happiness for all sentient beings, present and future, whatever the cost to oneself, was to bring in a God who desires the greatest total good of all living things and will reward and punish in accordance with this desire. Belief in such a God was necessary, Sidgwick thought, to restore coherence to our moral beliefs. But he did not commit himself one way or the other about whether this was sufficient reason to believe. It will always be possible, however, to escape the force of this argument. If we deny that morality gives us the end of the highest good, 
and so requires us to believe in its real possibility. We can always think of the moral demand, like Camus' portrayal of the command to Sisyphus to roll the rock up the mountain, as absurd, and shake our fists at the gods who have given us this task. But my guess is that if we really thought morality was absurd, we would not, in fact, sustain our attempt to live morally. Consider the possibility of an evil demon, rather like the evil demon Descartes imagines, who makes it impossible for us, roughly 70% of the time, to carry out what is morally good. Would we sustain the moral life in such a world? The second way of establishing a dependence relation of morality upon God is by means of what I'm going to call the argument from grace. And I'll again use an argument from Kant's religion within the boundaries of mere reason. To explain this argument, I need to mention that Kant recommends that we see revelation as two concentric circles. With historical revelation, the revelation to particular people at particular times and places in the outer circle, and the revelation to reason, supposedly to all people at all times and places, in the inner circle. The project of religion is then to see if the doctrines in the outer circle can be translated into the language of the inner circle by means of the moral concepts. Each of the four parts of the work ends with a general remark on a topic that Kant says belongs in the outer circle but in the area of the outer circle that borders upon the inner one. So we've really got three areas here, not just two. At the end of part one, the topic is effects of grace. Kant is here discussing a problem that he elsewhere refers to as Spainer's problem after the great Lutheran pietist. We humans are born, Kant says, under the evil maxim, which subordinates duty to happiness. Evil is not, though we're sometimes tempted to think so, simply the product of our sensory inclinations. Rather, it's a choice in the will to rank happiness over duty. Kant is here in the tradition of Luther, who denies that the source of evil is in the lower and grosser affections and locates it instead, I quote, in the highest and most excellent powers of man in which righteousness, godliness, and knowledge and reverence of God should reign, that is, in reason and will. Since we're born under this ranking of happiness over duty, we cannot reverse the ranking by our own devices, for this would require a choice that was already under the opposite ranking. Kant says that the propensity to evil is, I quote, not to be extirpated through human forces, for this could only happen through good maxims, something that cannot take place if the subjective supreme ground of all maxims is presupposed to be corrupted. Close quote. Here we have the problem that I've elsewhere called the problem of the moral gap, a gap between how we ought to live and how we can live by our own devices. Ought implies can, but in this case we ought to give pride duty to the, the priority ranking, but we seem to have a radical incapacity to do so. By presenting the problem in this way, Kant puts himself again in the tradition of Luther and Augustine. Augustine says that God bids us do what we cannot, <laughs> apparently violating what implies can, in order that we might learn our dependence upon God. In On Free Choice of the Will, he says both that we have lost our freedom to choose to act rightly and that we do have the ability to ask God for assistance. I quote, in the midst of their ignorance and difficulty, he, that is God, leaves them the free will to ask and seek and try. He will give to those who ask, show himself to those who seek, and open to those who knock. A key to a solution to the problem of the moral gap is to see that while ought implies can, ought does not imply can by our own devices. 
There are things we can do, but only with assistance from outside. Kant thus appeals to God's assistance in accomplishing what he calls a revolution of the will by which the ranking of happiness over duty is reversed. This, div this divine assistance is an effect of grace. Kant says, I quote, that we can admit an effect of grace as something incomprehensible, but we cannot incorporate it into our maxims for either theoretical or practical use. The reason we cannot make theoretical use of effects of grace is that they go beyond the limits of the understanding, and Kant thinks we need to confine the theoretical use of reason within these limits. The reason we cannot make practical use of effects of grace is that they are things that God does and not things that we do. Nonetheless, the appeal to effects of grace is the solution to what would otherwise be a contradiction in practical reason. Namely, that we both ought to and cannot live by the moral law. I would add, though this goes beyond Kant, that one of the effects of grace that makes the moral life livable is that grace makes forgiveness possible in cases where we cannot forgive ourselves for moral failure because we do not have the right moral status to do so. The view of the effects of grace that I'm defending here is that God intervenes in our situation and enables us to live by the moral demand that God puts upon us by divine command. Not only Kant, but many of the theologians and philosophers who preceded him recognized the presence of the gap between the moral demand and our natural capacities. The picture is basically Augustinian, inherited by Kant through Luther and the Lutheran pietists. But it can also be found outside Christianity, for example, in Aristotle and also in the Neo-Confucian Chu Si. It's always possible to evade the conclusion of this argument by denying the premise about the stringency of the demand. There are many ways to make this demand less stringent by distancing it from the categorical imperative. For example, the Kantian formulation requires us to treat humanity in every person as creating obligations for us so that we're to share the morally permitted ends of all those in need wherever they are in the world, whose lives we affect by our actions. One way to reduce the demand is to say that, unlike the Good Samaritan in Jesus' parable, we should consider that we have obligations only to the people we know who are related to us in special relations of family or friendship or community. But this reduction will end up with an ethics that is unacceptably parochial, though I do not know of any non-question-begging way to establish this. The third way of establishing a dependence relation of morality upon God is by means of what I call the argument from justification. Providence, grace, justification. We can ask what Christine Korsgaard has called the normative question, which is, why should I be moral? Or, why should I accept morality as a proper demand upon me? Here, I will not rely upon an argument from Kant, because Kant does not think he can give a justification of the moral demand. At least, in the second critique, he simply starts from what he calls the fact of reason, that we are under the moral law. I will end, however, by claiming an indirect connection with Kant's view that our dignity as humans resides in our responsiveness to the moral law. A divine command theorist will say that the answer to the normative question is that I should accept morality as a proper demand upon me because it's God who places this demand. This statement is, however, incomplete. A justification of a normative claim cannot be derived from a factual claim alone. To say that I ought to live a certain way because God tells me to do so requires, for completeness, the claim that I ought to do what God tells me to do. This feature of justification has led some philosophers, including Korsgaard herself, to think that a divine command to justification is question-begging. They ask, why should I do what God tells me to do? The difficulty they raise can be put in terms of a dilemma. Dilemma. 
either obedience to God is itself a moral obligation, or it is not. If it is, then to justify moral obligation by appealing to it is viciously circular. If it's not, then again, it seems no justification is available by this route. Or as Americans say, right. For it seems impossible that we could justify the claim that we have an obligation by appealing to something that is not itself a higher obligation. But then the project of justifying our moral obligations as a whole seems hopeless. There is a reply to this difficulty, however. Here I will use the distinction Scotus draws between natural law, strictly speaking, and natural law in an extended sense. He thinks that the command to love God given in the first table of the Ten Commandments, the law brought down by Moses on two tablets from Mount Sinai, is natural law, strictly speaking. It's known to be true just by knowing its terms, or it follows from propositions known in this way. But he thinks the second table, which concerns our various duties to the neighbor, is natural law only in an extended sense. It's true, but only contingently so. For our present purposes, we need to focus on the first table. It's necessarily true, Scotus holds, that God is to be loved. We know this just by knowing the terms, God and to be loved. This is because we know that if God exists, God is supremely good, and we know that what is supremely good is to be loved. It's also true that we know that to love God is to obey God. We know this because we know that to love God is to will what God wills for us to will. But willing what God wills for our willing is obedience. So it's necessarily true not just that God is to be loved, but that God is to be obeyed. Justifying the claim that the moral demand is a proper demand upon me by saying that moral obligation is constituted by God's command does not terminate in something that itself requires justification, except insofar as we have to justify the claim that God exists. This solution to the justification problem means that we need to revise the claim of divine command theory that all obligations are constituted by divine command. It now turns out that there is one obligation that is not so constituted, namely the obligation to obey God. We know that we have that obligation from its terms and not because it is itself constituted by God's command. I'm going to take the good to be the desirable in the following sense. If I say that something is good, I express the fact that I desire or love it, and I claim that it merits such desire or love. If we accept this proposal, we will have an account of the supervenience of goodness upon being. To say something is good, for example, a strawberry, is to say that it's good because of its natural properties, for example, sweetness, redness, ripeness, firmness, etc. These are the criteria for goodness in strawberries. But this description is not entailed by the evaluation that the strawberry is good without the prior endorsement of this set of descriptive criteria. We can now return to the normative question to the answer that the demand of morality is a proper demand upon me because it's God who makes the demand. This answer is, I said, incomplete and depends upon the addition of the claim that the principle that God is to be loved is known from its terms and is natural law, strictly speaking. We can tie this to the sense of good as follows. When I say that something is good, I'm expressing my desire or love for it, and I'm claiming that it is worthy to be desired or loved. We can now see that there are two seemingly opposite priority relations between what is obligatory, what's obligatory, and what's good. On the one hand, the good has priority over the obligatory because the justification relation is as I've just been explaining it. I should try to meet my moral obligations because God gives them to me, and obeying or loving God is necessarily good. On the other hand, 
the obligatory has priority over the good because there's an enormous number, probably an infinite number, of good things. And God, in prescribing some obligation, selects some of these goods and neglects others. Only the ones God selects for prescription are obligatory. If we agree with Karl Barth that God's prescriptions are paradigmatically to particular people at particular times, this makes it easier to see how God in prescribing is selecting some goods and neglecting others. For the goods central for one person at one time may be different from those that are central for another person or for the same person at a different time. The two priority relations are the opposite way round, but there's nothing contradictory in this because we have two different kinds of priority. The first kind of priority is what Aristotle calls priority in account, and the second is something more like veto or overridingness. The good has priority to the right because everything that's right is good, though not vice versa. The right has priority to the good because the goods that God selects as mandatory for us are, so to speak, trumps. In this account of the two different priority relations, we can see already a reply to one typical objection to divine command theory, namely that it makes morality arbitrary. This objection is sometimes tied to Plato's account in the Euthyphro of Socrates' question, is the holy holy because it's loved by the gods, or do they love it because it's holy? Socrates is clear that the answer to this question is the second alternative, that the gods love the holy because it's holy. But this answer has seemed to many philosophers to be fatal to divine command theory. If the gods love the holy because it's already holy, then they do not constitute its holiness by loving it. I've elsewhere argued that Socrates' actual argument for his conclusion leaves a great deal out. But I now want to make a different point, that Socrates has a truth here, but one that is consistent with the divine command theory as I've been describing it. God's commands are not arbitrary because what God commands is good. And the goodness is not constituted by the command. This does not, however, make God's command redundant because only those good things that are commanded are obligatory. The justification of moral obligation by God's command is more intimate than I've yet explained, and I'm going to end with this point. God's command constitutes not only moral obligation, but obligation of other kinds. In Judaism, for example, ceremonial and dietary obligations. In Christianity, obligations about baptism and Eucharist. In Islam, obligations about pilgrimage and daily prayer. But with moral obligation, we might say that God's command gives us not only the form, but also the matter or content of moral obligation. And I need to explain what I mean by that. So I'm going to try to do that. Kantian morality requires that we give equal moral status or dignity, as opposed to price, to all human beings. But it has proved hard to justify this status. I'll start with some brief remarks about Kant's own view, but I will then suggest that the theist can locate human dignity in our call by God, where a call is a kind of command. If I can make good this suggestion, then divine command will not merely give us a justification for the claim that we're under obligation, but it will ground the particular kind of obligation that is peculiar to morality. Kant scholars disagree about how Kant grounds his views about human moral status. He says in the groundwork that morality is the condition under which alone a rational being can be an end in itself since only through this is it possible to be a law-giving member in the kingdom of ends. Hence, morality and humanity insofar as it is capable of morality is that which alone has dignity. But does this mean we have to exclude many human beings as insufficiently rational? If we take Kant's language about the predisposition to the good seriously, we have a partial answer to this difficulty. The language of predisposition suggests strongly 
that he has reference to the species in mind. That's why he can say in religion that the predisposition to good is essential to us and the propensity to evil is not. And this would explain why in the metaphysics of morals, he says, I quote, children as persons have from procreation an original innate not acquired right to the care of their parents until they are able to look after themselves. Kant holds that we only have obligations to persons, and he here commits himself to the view that humans are persons from conception. This means that what makes something a person is not the manifestation of respect for the law, but its membership in a species in which some members have the potentiality for this kind of respect. If this is Kant's view, he can overcome some of the objections I've mentioned. Two-month-old infants, adults with Alzheimer's disease, belong to the human species and so have moral status. There is a difficulty, however. It's unclear why we should give status to members of a species who do not themselves have the relevant capacities. For example, infants born with severe mental retardation. If it's the existence of just those capacities in some of its members that's supposed to make the species valuable in the particular way that moral status implies. I myself do not see how to overcome this difficulty. Are we then left without a good way to ground human dignity? I want now to suggest that within the Abrahamic faiths we have a way to do this. I'll proceed by setting aside two ways that have been used within the traditions of these faiths, and then I will propose a third that takes us back to divine command. Suppose we ground human dignity in the fact that humans are created in the image of God. I'm not setting this aside. But the trouble is the passages, the few passages that mention this, tell us very little about what the image of God in a human being amounts to. Speculation has been continuous and manifold, ranging from our rationality or our freedom to our capacity for dominion or our capacity for relation as between male and female. The problem with all these accounts is that they are based on the capacities we can exercise in this life. And that's the first way I want to set aside. Because it's not clear how any such this world capacity based account can cover all human beings and give them the same basic dignity. Consider, for example, the capacity for dominion. Even if we take this to mean something like stewardship rather than mastery, there are many humans who do not have any significant capacity to look after or steward creation. One response to this point is to look for a theistic account of the basis of human dignity, not in human this world capacities, but in God's activity of conferring or bestowing value. This is the second way I'm setting aside. Nicholas Wolstorff says, I quote, what we need for a theistic grounding of natural human rights is some worth imparting relation of human beings to God that does not in any way involve a reference to human capacities. I will argue, he says, that being loved by God is such a relation. Being loved by God gives a human being great worth. And if God loves equally and permanently each and every creature who bears the imago dei, then the relational property of being loved by God is what we've been looking for. Waterstorff goes on to give an analogy. My friend shows me a particularly decrepit stuffed animal, a rabbit belonging to his child, but tells me that this is the animal loved by his son, Nathan. Nathan may acknowledge that lots of others are nicer, but this is the one he loves, not any of those. This is the one he's attached to. This is the one he's bonded with. Waterstorff suggests that God loves every human being equally and permanently with the love of attachment, and that this is just what respect for human worth requires. There's a problem with this account, however. 
We want an account of human value that makes it intrinsic to us. In the Genesis account, God created over the six days, and after each day, God looked at what had been created and saw that it was good after, actually, the creation of human beings, that it was very good. God's not portrayed here as reflecting upon the divine attachment, but seeing something good in the created order, and especially in the human life. Paul Weissman makes this objection to Walter Stoff's analysis, focusing on the analogy of the stuffed rabbit. If an adult abused the stuffed animal, perhaps she dropped it in the bath, she would do something very hurtful to Nathan. In performing the act, the adult, adult, adult would be failing to give appropriate consideration to Nathan's love for the rabbit and to the feelings to which that love makes Nathan liable. In performing the act, the adult would be under-respecting Nathan and failing to value Nathan highly enough. But would the adult be failing to respect the stuffed animal itself? It's hard to see that she would be. The analysis of human value as imparted value makes this value too transparent, as though we see through it to God's value without any value added. A successful theistic account of human value needs to accommodate both the relation to God, who is the ultimate source of all value, and the intrinsic value of what God creates. There is an account that meets these conditions. I take it from David Kelsey. Actually, he got it from Bart. Kelsey writes, I quote, Human beings' inherent accountability for their response to God provides the theological basis on which the peculiar dignity of human creatures is to be understood. Human dignity is thus, he says, eccentric, grounded and centered outside human creatures. But if dignity is centered outside human creatures, how can it be intrinsic to the human creature? Kelsey asks, what is the justification for ascribing this kind of value to human beings? And he answers that the justification is not from our this world capacities, but from God's calling us to a certain vocation. This calling is particular, different for each concrete human person. In this way, the ground is not something abstract or universal like Kant's personality. There's a good reply here to the charge that locating the ground of human value in God's attachment to us makes our value extrinsic. On this conception, there's a call by God to each one of us, a call to love God in a particular and unique way. We can think of the value of each of us as residing in us, in the particular relation to God into which we're called. What we have here is an intrinsic good in a slightly odd sense. Not that we have value, each of us, all by ourselves, which is one thing the phrase intrinsic value might mean, since I've said we have it in relation. But the value is not reducible to the valuing by someone outside us on this account, but resides in what each of us can uniquely be in relation to God. In order that this account can escape the objection to a this-world capacity-based account, we have to be able to believe that God proportions or fits the call to each human being. And there may not be much we can recognize as cognitive capacity in this life that is a precondition of such proportioning. I recognize that to non-theists, this belief will seem merely an attempt to escape from harsh reality. I claimed at the beginning of this section that this theist reply to the request for a justification was indirectly from Kant. So I'm going to end now with just this brief point. I'm within my 45 minutes. Amazingly. I will end by trying to support that claim. Kant's view 
throughout his published corpus is that we should recognize our duties as God's commands. But in religion, he undertakes a translation project as a philosophical theologian, translating historical revelation given to particular people at particular times into the revelation to reason, the same for all people at all times, using the moral concepts. On my view, he does not mean to reduce historical revelation to the revelation to reason, but to leave what he calls biblical theology as it is. That's his aspiration. Whether he actually does it is a separate question. In the course of this translation, he proposes to talk about the Trinity in relation to the problem of our falling short of the life we ought to lead, the problem that I call the moral gap. I quote, the law says, be ye holy in the conduct of your lives as your Father in heaven is holy. And Kant translates this, the conformity of the conduct of one's life to the holiness of the law. With this translation in mind, we can see Kant's language about our dignity residing in our responsiveness to the moral law as a translation of more traditional language about responsiveness to God's command. Kant, indeed, is willing to talk of, I quote, the call of human beings to be citizens of an ethical state, though he insists that we do not understand how beings can be both created and free. I'm not saying that Kant has the idea of the particularity of the call. I think he does not. But he does have the idea that what gives us our dignity is our being receivers and potential responders, but not actual responders. It's not our actual response that gives us dignity. As I tried to show earlier, he ties this potential responsiveness to our membership in the human species. The basic idea of locating our dignity in our being receivers and potential responders to God's call is already in Kant and is part of his inheritance from the Lutheran catechisms of his youth. Thank you. Professor Hare, thank you for this insightful talk. Um, I'm going to briefly summarize the main moves of your argument, and in conjunction with that summary, raise several questions in the hopes of opening up further discussion in areas of the presentation I found particularly interesting. As I understood it, your paper has three primary arguments. First, you argue that if a person is seriously dedicated to morality, such that they have committed themselves to pursuing the highest good of all as a moral end, then the idea of God rationally fits or makes coherent their pursuits, as only belief in God gives us the real possibility of the highest good being made actual, as neither nature nor we ourselves seem able to accomplish it. I've always liked this argument of Kant's, and I really appreciate the clarity with which you have laid it out. <clears throat> that being said, I have a question about the conception of religion that this argument entails. It seems to me that reasonable hope in the real possibility of the actualization of the highest good does not necessarily require God, as Professor Hare, you or Kant have formulated the idea, but is rather fairly amenable to various conceptions of the divine and or various metaphysical systems. For an example, I have in mind the idea of karma, which in Hinduism does not necessitate a belief in one God, a super sensible author of nature who promulgates the law, runs the universe in accordance with it and judges our success in accomplishing it, but rather has a conception of the soul as being reborn in many lives, in which, in which one's righteousness and one's happiness are always being aligned. In each rebirth, as one finds oneself in one's current station due to one's past moral and immoral actions, might we not say that, given the moral need for the real possibility of the realization of the highest good, we have the right to practically postulate karma and rebirth instead of God and immortality. 
While this conception is religious, and so perhaps does not ultimately impact your basic point, it seems a very different conception of religion. And so I ask us to consider, could this be a reformulation? And if so, would it impact the argument at all? <clears throat> Secondly, in order to explicate and resolve the experience of the moral gap, i.e. the experience of the gap between what I know I ought to do and that which I seem capable of, you make use of Kant's argument that humans have a basically evil maxim and consequently need a revolution of the will. Kant argues that we are born under an evil or self-interested maxim, which is demonstrated by the fact that we do rank happiness over duty at times in our lives. Therefore, on our own steam, we seem unable to become good as such a transformation would require of us a decision grounded itself on a basically good maxim, which we do not have. And so in accordance with this, we postulate God's grace as the agent of such a revolution in the will. As you have helpfully pointed out, this is a position inherited from an Augustinian Lutheran tradition, and as such, being a Lutheran myself, I strongly identify with it experientially. I do wonder, however, at how convincing such an argument is going to be to most non-religious individuals. It seems to me that many people might want to say that the experience of the moral gap is not rooted in a basically self-interested maxim, but in ignorance, such that when one does that which one should not, supposedly knowingly, one simply does not fully comprehend the law which one seemingly disobeys. The problem is not the will, which is good, but one's knowledge, which is incomplete, and what is needed is not a revolution of said will, but education. And so I wonder what this gathering thinks. Is there not a chance that someone like Socrates might be right, that if we truly know the law, we can accomplish it? Your third argument, as I understood it, might be summarized thusly. To question the justification of, excuse me, to the question of justification of normativity itself, one can answer, one ought to be moral because God places the moral demand upon you and one has an obligation to obey God. While this may seem circular, it is not for the claim you ought to obey God. It's not itself a moral obligation, but a necessary one <clears throat> known by the terms themselves. For one knows by natural law alone that God is to be loved and consequently that God is to be obeyed. You argue with this in the following manner. One knows by the terms alone that if God exists, God is supremely good, and that which is supremely good is to be loved. And further, to love another is to will their will as your own in so far as possible, which in the case of God is to will that which God wills for us, or in other words, to obey God. And so, if God exists, one necessarily ought to obey God. Now, you define the good, as you have named God, as that which supervenes upon being which we can identify in the world due to our capacity to see and respond to the good. As such, when a person names something as good, she is claiming that she sees it and loves it, and it merits that love. It is good in itself. Which means that God is good, not because we have projected it upon God, nor because God defines the term by fiat, but because God objectively satisfies the criteria of worthiness to be loved. And therefore, with regards to morality, we can claim both that what God commands is not arbitrary, for the good is independent of God's command, it is not defined by it, and God commands good things, since God is necessarily supremely good. And yet, we can also claim on your account that what God commands is not redundant, as only by God's command are good things made obligatory, as God is the ground of obligation itself. You end this lovely paper with a reflection on the way in which your account of the justification of normativity upon God's command helps ground equal human dignity of all as a moral concept. You show the way in which a this-worldly capacities account has trouble covering all persons, and you argue that an account of human dignity rooted in God's love for humanity, a sort of relational account, is too transparent, noting that such a relational value doesn't get at the intrinsic nature of human dignity. Instead, you offer a David Kelsian account of human dignity that emphasizes that each one of us has been called or divinely commanded into relationship with God as our final end, rooted in our particular individual capacity for loving God in our unique way. God's command or call as the ground of moral obligation 
is, it turns out, what constitutes the human dig dignity of each and every human person. And so it gives us the content as well as the form of morality. I want to wrap up this response with just a couple of final questions for the group to consider in relation to this final argument. First, I wonder about the premise of the argument, that one knows by natural reason alone that if God exists, God is supremely good. Again, perhaps as a Lutheran, I am wary of this claim, and I would be interested if we might discuss it more in the question and answer period. It seems to me that by natural reason alone, the concept of God does not seem to particularly ground the ground of all good or to be good in God's self, but rather to be more simply the ground of all, evil and good alike, and so seems distinctly ambiguous. God sends rain on the just and unjust. Second, I'm curious as to how one might relate religions. Professor Harry, you mentioned both Islam and Judaism in this paper, but I wonder what we might say about seemingly conflicting divine commands. How do we know what God's command for us is? And how do we distinguish it from self-obligation or worse, self-delusion? And if this conflict between religions regarding perceived divine commands is a possibility, does it pressure at all the way in which your argument relates the justification of normativity itself to the content of morality in the concept of universal hum human dignity? Um, thank you again, Professor Hare, for this paper and for the chance to reflect and respond to it. Um, the arguments you present are extremely provocative and merit extensive reflection to which I open up the discussion now to questions. So we have to think that God exists in order to ground the real possibility. 
that's how we get to the constant. So it's not a regulative principle in the second critique, it's a constitutive principle. And we can think about Kant's project as a whole now, yeah. all three critiques. In the first critique, are setting up regulative principles yes. for theoretical reason. In the second critique, are setting up constitutive principles for practical reasons. And then in the third critique, yeah. bring the two together. Do you think realize there's a reference to constitutive in that way about God? So, you, uh, so you're saying that we can have knowledge of God or it's constitutive of the highest good? No, we can't have knowledge of God because. No, well, that's right. Um, so, what sense is constitutive then? I'm, I just. So, in other words, within practical reason, yeah. we are required to make the claim that God exists. Not just that we have to think as if God exists, yeah. but that we have to. We have to believe in that God. We have to believe that God exists. And he, he, he's, 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 he's quite explicit about that. Uh, okay, that's just how I got the beginning of the discussion. <laughs> so now, the other thing you mentioned is about autonomy. And here again, there's a huge amount to say. Um, uh, in the groundwork, um, he's wanting to say that it would be heterodox to do our duty out of fear of what God would give us if we don't, or out of delight in what God would give us if we do. Yes. So that, that would be heterodox. Yes. Um, yes. But um, it's not heteronomous to think of God as sovereign uh, in, even in the groundwork. Kant distinguishes between the sovereign of the kingdom of Adams, the king of the kingdom of Adams, and the members of the kingdom of Adams. The king, the sovereign, is also a member, but the sovereign, unlike any other member, has power completely adequate to his will. So, yeah. so, so, so uh, to think of ourselves in a kingdom with a sovereign who is legislating and running the universe and judging <laughs> these three things, that's not heteronomous. But future power may be the This relation to, to God's command, 
is the kind. We work out what we ought to do by the categorical imperative procedure. And then we attribute that conclusion to God's commandment. But isn't that the point where you have to tell me? No, I don't I don't yeah. I don't see that. No, okay. Thank you. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a delightful lecture. Yeah. I want to uh, ask you to extend some reflections on human dignity in the following way. Yeah. Um, I agree with you that positions that rest human dignity on capabilities is a very problematic. Yeah. I agree with you on that completely. However, one of the things those arguments do is to show the ways in which human beings are vulnerable to our actions upon them. And therefore, what kinds of requirements may be demanded of us, and what specific needs and goods the other person may have, which will provide some orientation for our actual practical engagement with them. If you ground human dignity in a relation to the divine, who then supervenes and the command on the individual, in what respect then are we morally vulnerable to each other? Yeah. And if we are not, what exactly is the force of the moral life? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't think, though, that our experience of the world is one that leaves our vulnerability an open question. I, I think we can see perfectly well what harm we do to each other. Uh, and we can see perfectly well that when we do that, we're doing wrong. Uh, what this kind of hope that Kant has gives us in addition is not a whitewashing of the, of, of, of the, of the evil that we experience, but that somehow, in the long run, God will make it good. So it doesn't remove our, our vulnerability down here. I know that, but what I'm saying is if dignity itself yeah. is served by God, yeah. and on the theistic picture I think you're giving, God is unchangeable, God is not in need of anything, I'm not quite sure then what the status of human dignity is. Could human dignity ever be tarnished if it is rooted in an unchangeable, yeah. divine reality. Yeah, I don't think human dignity can be tarnished. It can be violated, <coughs> but it can't be tarnished. It can't be removed. It can't be eliminated. It, it, is, it is guaranteed. But we can indeed act in contravention of it, uh, and, and we, we often do. Um, so. My conception is God is calling each one of us. I like the picture of the men on the white stone that God's going to give us in heaven. That, that name is, is what we are, uh, like Peter. And we're being called into that name. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm interested in uh, the argument that you drew from Kelsey about human dignity being grounded in uh, God's personal call to us and uh, our responsibility to God uh, to, uh, to live into that call. Uh, you mentioned it. You mentioned also enhancing uh, the, the relational understanding of those two understandings uh, as similar and how you can see them as different. Yeah, so when you say relational, 
contributes to the whole loving by the whole community. Uh, it's not something that we do on our own. Uh, and so the, the unique way of loving that each one of us does is going to be also a unique way of loving other people. I don't think there's any inconsistency here. Oh, hi. So, um, I guess just more of a clarification. Um, is, is, is what I'm hearing you saying is that a call is different, a call is different from a command? Uh, or, or a call is still a command? And I guess only because I, I've, I've never, ever, ever understood the command to love. Um, does that, does that make sense? Uh, yeah. yeah. And then I just have a, a quick second sort of question as well. I mean, very quickly, um, the idea somehow that against Walterstorff that our quote unquote inherent dignity actually is bestowed by God. So in some sense, it's not really an inherent dignity, especially somehow if it's get, given by God. So somehow the move to the call allows for a, a kind of affirmation of, an, a, again, an inherent dignity, but it's still dependent yeah. on the call. Yeah. So, yeah, if you just sort of comment on those two things very quickly, that'd be great. Okay. Good. So, scholastics, oh, um, here's a, um, a Latin example. I think this is how they remember it. Probably it's probably that permitted constant in it. Those are the five types of command. So, so the, uh, God prescribes, God prohibits, God permits, God counsels, and God fulfills. So that, that last one is when God says, let there be light. Now, I want to defend the notion of a divine counsel. And I think a call is a kind of counsel. But here I, I depart from a lot of um, Protestant from perhaps who thought there was something suspicious that the notion of a divine council. And um, if we, we would take a, you know, we, we have to, there's a lot to say about it. Um, I think that God can advise. And that when God gives us that kind of advice, it's not a command in the sense in which there is condemnation in the offing for, for refusing to, to conform. Yeah. Just a quick follow up to that. Yes. But I don't I hear any, uh, you know, in terms of especially some of the, in the patristic tradition, uh, I don't hear in any of that sort of God's desire. So the call has an element of desire to it. Yeah. In other words, I, yeah, it, would be great, it would be great if we could be this way, right? I mean, that's different from counsel. Um, so a counsel is given by God, I, I would suggest, as a way to get us to the kind of union that God desires. Yes. So it's not that the desire isn't there, it's just that the desire is given a word, it's given uh, a communication in the council. Uh, but, but some people, I, I can't, for example, didn't believe in divine councils. Uh, and uh, so I say there's a long, there's a long history, a long history here. But uh, I don't like the conception of God as either commanding with condemnation, or just simply silent. And I think there's an intermediate possibility. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture. It's quite a great way to start this morning. Um, you used to, in my mind, play out uh, both the distinction and the relationship between the obligatory and the good at the early part of your third section yeah. there. And yet, as you moved into discussions of human dignity, that either seemed to disappear or to, or to perhaps um, disappear into one another. Um, and it seems that those would be quite useful categories as 
about dignity in particular for humans. Because we, we can recognize the good of uh, particular individuals um, and yet not identify that um, that is a dignity that lions are beholden to, for example. You know, lion is, if we want to go with the, the link with man eater, um, we, don't, we wouldn't say that a, a, a human's dignity in a particular way is violated by being eaten by a lion. And yet we can still identify the goodness of that individual. And so there's still the obligation that we identify and dignity is called onto moral agents in a particular way. Yeah. And yet we still extend, we identify that goodness. So it seems, at least in the language that you've already sort of put forward, that that there are particular prioritizations for moral agents yeah. um, towards other human beings. So yeah. In the Kantian sphere, we <clears throat> never merely as means. We clearly to use something as a means to identify it as a goodness um, to it, an instrumental goodness. Yeah. And so it seems that we can avoid totally locating um, <coughs> in something extrinsic <coughs> while, while still locating the prioritization in something extrinsic. And that would help further an argument of um, a human dignity that still allows for us to tailor it towards particular human capacities without ever having to lose. Um, I mean, such that we wouldn't say that it is a violation of dignity not to extend the right to vote to infants, for example. Whereas we could say that it's a violation of dignity yeah. not to extend it to people who have the capacity to govern themselves. So I, I, I'm just wondering if you could maybe, whether whether that's a distinction that you would prefer to that you would carry on into yeah. your own particular formulation and, and then the difference that that would make. Yeah, that's helpful. I, 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 I do want to carry it on. Um, actually, uh, this is the first to set of thoughts in an enormous manuscript. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, um, so, I want to say that the things that God makes obligatory are themselves goods. But some of those goods are trumps, are made mandatory for us to pursue. And I would want to say human dignity is one such good. So, but that goodness that we have is not to be violated. It itself imposes on us a duty. Uh, and I, I want to, yeah, I want to tie what I said about, about the good and the obligatory to this notion of dignity in that way. So, just to, so that would mean then that it's the obligation that is born out of that loving relationship, that, that untrumpability, and not necessarily the, the goodness per se. The, the goodness already pre exists yeah. because of, of, of creation. Yeah. So and, 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 but, but it's that, that tr untrump of that prioritization yeah. of, of the human as good to other humans and to God yeah. and to all the world yeah. agents um, that, that is born out of this call. That's right. Love the That's right. I, I just, um, back to Lion, um, I have talked as though humans were the only things with dignity. Um, but actually, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I, I, I think we don't, know, we don't know enough yet, but it, I think it is, it is possible that there are other creatures who have dignity also. But, but, but anyway, I, I didn't open up that can of worms until just now. Thanks, I'll join others in uh, thank you for a very stimulating uh, lecture. And, and I'll also pile on, I guess, in terms of talking about uh, dignity. Yeah. Uh, there are lots of other good things we can talk about in the lecture. But, uh, um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to press on a little bit is the way in which perhaps your um, notions of dignity depend on your conception of the good. Uh -huh. uh, and um, when you're talking about the strawberry, it's the sort of example. Uh -huh. It seems to me that your use of good um, is as a predicate. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with the distinction that uh, Philip Foote uh, makes between uh, predicative and attributive yeah. adjectives yeah. and, and yeah. each 
Yeah, and she does. When we say, <laughs> when we say, it's like, when we say something that was good, um, um, it depends upon the knowledge of that thing in an attributed way. Right? Yeah. Um, and that um, uh, you're intended to use good in the more, I think, um, uh, uh, predicative way. And it leads you, I think, in the end, to putting a little bit more emphasis on the external um, value. Yeah. Evaluation of yeah. the thing by God. Yeah. Um, um, and I wondered if um, it's not even a very friendly Kantian way to think of intrinsic good right, as the value that something has by virtue of being the kind of thing that it is, yeah. um, which makes it you know, kind specific or maybe you know, species specific um, value, which then could also be um, given to other creatures coming to your last. That all things have an intrinsic uh, value in that sense. Just the yeah. intrinsic value of the human um, has an attributive uh, adjective. It's what we call uh, Yeah. Yeah. So each wrote this article. This was a dispute between each and my father um, uh, about whether all good is attributed. Each say it was. So, uh, and to, 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 to know what good means uh, is deducible from the thing that is called good. You know, when good horses, I know more horses, and so on. Um, my father. I uh, wanted to say in return, in response, that though that fits certain things that are good, it doesn't fit all. So if I say there was a beautiful sunset, it's good. I don't mean it's doing well the sorts of things that sunsets are for. <laughs> it's not, it's, that is not an attributive use. Or if I say pleasure is good, I'm not saying that pleasure is a natural kind and, and, and goodness here is simply to be deducible from knowledge of that natural kind. Uh, I think my father went too far in denying attributive goods. I think that there is something we can know about the good of the horse just from knowing that it's a horse. Uh, but I don't think that we know moral good attributed. Okay. So I think that we need a predictive notion of good if we're going to talk about moral good in a Kantian way. Now, that notion of good, that Kantian notion of the good will, is not to be found, I think, in Aquinas uh, or in the sources that he chose. So we have a long <coughs> history of dispute here uh, about natural law, but I think I think each claim is too ambitious about the nature of the good as a whole. Um, thank you again for your talk. Uh, I have a question just a clarification again to the final point that you made about the receiver potential responders to us all. Um, it seems that's very analogous to the Islam concept. But I didn't know how exactly that gets around the, the, the two sort of critiques of, of, of one being too transparent to use it another day um, and the capabilities of it. So if you receivers, if I understand about the receivers, um, would then have the problem of being uh, too transparent, right? because then you have everybody in equal measure having some sort of ability to receive what all God is extrinsic. As, as potential responders, then you have now the capabilities argument that you have proportionate ability to respond, and then we have people with different amounts of dignity based on their uh, in following the law or not the law, whatever else it might be. So I, I, I didn't get how they got around the two dominant things they got before, uh, but rather put them together both of the problems and the shortcomings of each. Maybe I didn't understand, but I just want you to kind of crystallize that. Yeah, correct. 
ethics. And I'm, I'm a novice in Islamic ethics, um, but there is actually a large chapter in this manuscript. Because one of the, one of the um, to me, fascinating things is that when I read the Tazilites uh, and the Ashurites, um, I see many of the same distinctions uh, arising. And the, the, there's one particular thinker I found, his name's Arnold Brady. Uh, and alas, I don't read the original language. Uh, this is the first time in my professional life when I've <laughs> written <laughs> I have, but I have to rely on my students. <laughs> because Nigeria really is not often not translated. Uh, so but what I find in, in Matuidi, and this is fascinating, is many of the same distinctions in scholars are there in Matuidi. Uh, and it's not because there was any direct influence, it's because if you're trying to work out how God is sovereign and we also have to work out what to do, and you have to put those two things together. There aren't really many options. <laughs> it's the same set of distinctions and the same, the, the, the same alternatives uh, that arise in all three, I want to say, of the eight living faiths. Uh, so, um, I think this notion of our value residing in our response to a call by God is something I could find in my dream. Can I question? I just wondered whether, I'm um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. I just wondered whether, we're flying? Yes, go ahead. Whether um, this whole notion of uh, wanting to make the relation to God uh, intrinsic couldn't be well accommodated by the notion of um, uh, that were naturally made for paraphoresis. Um, um, in other words, it's, when you talk about a call of God, that makes it sound like, well, God could have made human beings, and they could have been human, and they could have done the human thing, yeah. but God might not have called them, you know, like yeah. the Bible, he calls Israel, but not others, and so forth. Yeah. Whereas, if you think, well, human beings, I mean, are such that, um, we're a kind of odd, straddling thing metaphysically, and to become fully personal, we need to be, um, we need to, we need God as a functional partner to become who, uh, yeah. what we're designed to be, yeah. um, would make it intrinsic, but would involve uh, God in it intimately. All right, good, I like that very much. Um, actually, uh, I like to say that our end is to be co lovers to be what? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, we, we enter, we enter into the love that is between the members of the Trinity. Mm. Uh, and uh, that is what we're made for. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> that I think we know just by knowing what sorts of creatures we are. However, I also want to say with Scotus, we can't deduce the moral world from that. Uh, so uh, we know our end but just by knowing what creatures we are. We don't know, for example, not to steal or not to lie or not to commit uh, adultery and so on from knowing our end. That requires, in addition, some some kind of answer to that. I guess I want to make a distinction. I agree with you about that, but I, I just want to make a distinction between it being our end to enjoy the Trinitarian friendship circle yeah. um, and it our being by nature designed for character functioning. Because I think Scotus doesn't believe that we are by nature designed for that. I think he may think we have the passive capacity to receive it, but he thinks that we can function as human beings just fine. Um, and it's a, it's a contingent choice which God wouldn't have had to make to reward um, us for that end. Whereas I suppose that someone like um, Bonaventure or maybe Anselm would have held a different view. 
That's important for me to know, and you know Scotus a lot better than I do. I think he's a little more Aristotelian in his conception of human nature. Yeah. So if you reason by analogy with what they say about divine illumination, where um, uh, the people who believe in it say, look, it's because our, I mean, it's true that the cows have that they're building capacities to do their thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's because our capacity, our function is so excellent that we are built for collaboration. And I think if you sort of generalize that from the cognitive <coughs> I, I will um, get from you afterwards the texts in which Scotus says that our end of entering into this uh, um, divine love is contingent. Because I haven't actually seen it that way, but I, I am willing to I'll look at the texts. If you will give them to me. It's not that it could fail to be true that we have an obligation to look out of the wall. It's rather the paraphernalia. We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Thank you.